Our guest today is commissioner of the, of the Department of Buildings for the city of Chicago. She was appointed by Mayor Emanuel just over 15 months ago. Our guest today is responsible for 285 employees and a $37 million budget. She and her team play a vital role in public safety and neighborhood protection, have the important responsibility to review plans and permits, to enforce the building code, and perform inspections of buildings under construction as well as annual inspections. And she's so smart, she brought her husband with today. And he's with us, Dwayne Davis. Say hi to everyone, Dwayne, don't be shy. Ladies and gentlemen, Felicia Davis. Give her a round of applause. All right, have fun up here. Well, it's a full house. I am um, extremely humbled and honored to be here today, so I want to thank you. I want to thank you, Jay. I want to thank the City Club for inviting me to speak, but also for just being a beacon and, and civic discourse and providing these opportunities. I also want to thank Jackie, who assured me that this room would not just be me and you and Jay. And, <laughs> and so I want and the four walls and maybe my folks from buildings, right? So Jackie, I want to thank you for the encouragement for telling me that. I also want to thank each and every one of you for being here today. It's really um, to look across all the faces, and I see a lot of my past in this room as well. I have colleagues that I worked with at Kendall College. I have colleagues that I, including Howard here, who recruited me. <laughs> I have um, colleagues from the Chicago Police Department here. I have my colleagues from the Department of Buildings, and do please stand again and be recognized. Every day, it's the work that we all endeavor to do together to protect the, the residents and visitors to the city of Chicago. I also have a lot of just good girlfriends, and you have to have those in your life. And so, all of the good girlfriends of Felicia, please stand. <laughs> Dory, I don't see you standing. <laughs> So um, first and foremost, too, I want, oh, I, I hear some coughing because I think I may have overlooked. I also want to thank, I, all of the elected officials have been, have been acknowledged, and there are another, a number of appointed officials that are in the room as well. I know City Club is really great at acknowledging um, elected officials. I also want to give a nod to the other appointed officials in the room, the other folks who work for our electeds day in and day out. I know that Commissioner Maria Guerra Lopesic is here from Business Affairs and Consumer Protection. Greg Stemmons here from Liquor Commission and Control. Some of the other folks, Vance Henry from the Mayor's Office, Deputy Chief of Staff to the Mayor for Faith-Based and Community Initiatives, and perhaps some other people, but it's all of us working together, and so that's equally important. And so, now that I think um, folks in the room, I want to thank Mayor Emanuel. I want to thank the mayor for the opportunity to serve. So those of you who don't know me, I'm going to give you a little primer. Um, prior to be appointing, appointed to commissioner of the Department of Buildings, I worked as the mayor's first de deputy chief of staff in his office leading the public safety portfolio. And I was part of his transition team, and I came in to um, return to city service with him in 2011 in the mayor's office. And we did a lot of stuff in those first few years. Also leading up through the NATO summit, I was the person responsible, and that's when I had really some, a lot of interaction with the Department of Buildings, then when Mike Merchant was there, um, preparing the city so that we could pull off a successful summit, weekly meetings, operational meetings to make sure that we were delivering on the mayor's promise that the city was going to be open, the trains were going to be running, the buses were going to be running, and we did that. We delivered a successful summit. And then I started the Office of Public Engagement, and part of what I'll talk about in this, in this talk is to really forge those relationships between government and, and um, all of the residents in the city of Chicago. Because to be honest with you, most folks don't know what government does for them outside of police, pick up snow, garbage, potholes, schools. There are a lot of services that the city, so the breadth and range of the services that the city provides to, the, to, um, to residents and visitors in Chicago. So I want to thank the mayor for um, asking me to lead the Department of Buildings, but also just for leading the charge every day and for being very, very clear about our priorities and the choices that we face and very clear about the direction that the city needs to go in. 
each day he guides us to um, respect taxpayers, and I say this to my team on a regular basis. Every dollar that we spend in my department, I say to them, another taxpayer, because everyone say, I'm a taxpayer too. Another taxpayer earned that dollar, and so we're going to respect that, and we're going to be respectful of it, we're going to be efficient, and then we're going to think about that when we're making decisions. So not just our operational decisions, but also policy decisions, and how is that going to matter? Because it's not just about the bricks and mortar. I don't just care about the bricks and mortar. I also care about the people who live in those buildings, the people who visit those places. And that is the most important charge and the most important thing that I keep in mind every day as my team and I go about this work. And the other thing I want to do is to acknowledge other partners in the room. Um, many of you are from the design um, um, communities, and you are a partner, whether you like it or not, because what we do, we can't do without you. Um, it's the yin and the yang, and we work together, and I want to thank you all for being here today. And lastly, I want to thank the peanut butter to my jelly, Dwayne Davis. He's a cop, so he's going to be like, really, you said that in front of everybody, and now he's, because, you know, cops can be very, I want to thank my husband for being here today. And he definitely doesn't like the attention, so he's now wishing there was a trap door in the floor so he could just disappear. So as a global hub for business and industry, Chicago welcomes the building and construction activity that takes place throughout our city each and every day. For construction is really a leading indicator of growth, um, economic development, and activity that's happening in the city, as well as job creation. The Department of Buildings has the tall task of supporting the life the safety and quality of life for all the residents and visitors in the city of Chicago. And we do that mainly through the enforcement of the Chicago Building Code. But there are pieces of it, and I'll talk about, like, folks think they know the department and they think of it very transactional because it's a permit or an inspection, and I don't think they understand the full breadth and range of what the department does. So we, of course we do this through permits and inspection. We also do it through trade licensing and code enforcement. As the issue of building permits, Chicago is really, or the building, the Department of Buildings is at the forefront of some of the activity, the economic activity that happens in the city. So as a stepping off point, I'm going to begin this presentation by giving you three key metrics from 2014 representative of the increasing economic development of the city of Chicago. The first number is $7.1 billion. $7.1 billion, that's the declared value of the projects that the Department of Bishu Buildings issued permits for in 2014. And to give you kind of a frame of reference for where we stand on that, in 2012, just two short years ago, that number was $3.7 billion. So significant growth that's happening throughout our, our, our city. And I might add, because I'm a Southsider, I am a neighborhood girl, and it's not just about what happens in our central business district, but it is equally as important what's happening in our communities. I have our friends here from Mercy Home, and I know of a young man who just took a house in Pilsen and rehabbed it with his bare hands and now is a new resident in Pilsen. There are stories like that all across the city of Chicago, so it's not just about what happens in our city or city, but the rubber meets the road in our neighborhoods and communities as well. So another thing, just to give a frame of reference, so that 2012 number, $3.7 billion, so in that same period from 2012 until 2014, some of our top general contractors, so who's, who's building these buildings? Who's out there doing the work? Power had $1.8 billion worth of, develop, worth of permit activity through my department. Passion, $615 million. McHugh, $1.5 billion. Pepper, $642 million. Lindley's, $3.5 billion. Ujama, $96 million. Bully and Andrews, $519 million. Walsh, $1.3 billion. And so those companies have also seen growth. Those companies create jobs. So that for, that's 44000 over 44,000 building permits the department issued just in 2014, so just going back to 2014. That's the highest number of permits that the city has issued and processed through this department since the economic downturn. So it's pretty significant. Later on, I'll show you another slide of what that looks like. And that also represents a gain of 9,100 jobs to the city. So as such, the ongoing vision for the department must include how we become more efficient in our permitting and inspections so that we can encourage and enhance this activity while also maintaining the necessary code provisions to make sure that this activity happens safe and so that we're protecting folks in these buildings. So it brings me to a quote that I, um, it's typically right now my email, on the bottom of my email it tells everyone what he 
is required, temperature for heat is required, but outside of that when it's not heat season, <laughs> 66 degrees and 68 degrees. So when it's not heat season, <laughs> This is a quote that I have on every email, and it is simply, we shape our buildings and thereafter they shape us. And what's really important and significant about that quote is that the Department of Building stands there at the beginning when we're shaping our buildings. So when we're doing plan review, going through the process, identifying and making sure that things are being done in accordance to ordinance and, and, and rules and the regulations provided, we're also there at the end because we're in the middle, we're in the thereafter. While the building is useful, while folks are are interacting in the building, using the building, visiting the building, building. So we're there then, and we're also at the end. When that building has come to the end of its useful life, and we have a number of buildings in Chicago that have come to the end of their useful life, and that's where the Department of Buildings really um, takes the lead in, in, in protecting residents and visitors for buildings that have no longer, um, no longer useful, no longer occupied, and, and folks have discarded them, have long discarded them at the Department of Building. So personally, there are four things that I talk about. Every time I talk to somebody, some of you have heard this before, every meeting that I have, every time I think about this, it's crystal clear to me these are personal values to me, and these are the values that I've brought to the department, and I've been very clear about how we're going to attack them. Our integrity, our responsiveness, our competence, and our efficiency. Integrity, responsiveness, and competence are required for the public's trust. They do not trust a department if we do not lead with our integrity, and that means we build trust with our customers, we build trust internally, and we project integrity in everything we do. We put the, his, the past behind us, and we move forward with, those, with that as a key principle. Our responsiveness. I talked about this earlier. People, I'm, I am amazed. I'm still amazed that people are amazed, and I hear this frequently, and it's not just about the Department of Buildings, but just in general, when folks say, I'm surprised somebody picked up the phone. I'm surprised that somebody returned an email. Graham calls me, you're still in the office, it's seven o'clock. Like, why are you calling if you didn't think I'd be here? It's a good question. <laughs> it is a good question, why are you calling if you didn't think I'd be here? So, to leave a message, he says. So we have to be, we really do have to be responsive. If you're not even picking up the phone, you've lost a battle. And then this, I backed into this, so I was on the phone helping with, some, with something in the office one day and I needed to touch somebody else in the department that was at one of our other offices, picked up the phone and called him. So of course it goes to voicemail, which is not a problem, but then the voicemail was full. So then it sends me to another thing and that voicemail was full. And, I'm, and so now I'm like, I'm the grandmother on the west side of Chicago that just got a notice from the Department of Buildings and how do I feel? Because the person that I'm trying to call, they're not there and then the person who is the backup for them, well they're not there and I can't leave a message there. And you know what it means when a voicemail box is full at City? That means that's at least 52 messages. My director of, Inform of uh, information systems is here because we check. 52 messages that have been unanswered for some period of time. So we started with that, picking up the phone, running reports, knowing when people are not, not doing so. But also, the other thing, we had a whole bunch, Brennan knows this, we had a whole bunch of email addresses and telephone extensions that were no longer being used. So I'd say, pe people say to me, well I mean, I emailed your department and I didn't get an answer, I didn't get an answer. Well where did you email? We're chasing this circle of nowhere. It's forwarded to this person who's no longer there to this person. So we did it on and we got rid of over 200 phone extensions as well as emails so that we can be clear and we can increase our responsiveness inside of the department. I talked about our, our, our competence a little bit. This is what I know for a fact. Every, there are a lot of people in my department who are smart. There are subject matter experts in their field, and for a fact I know that buildings, there are buildings in the city of Chicago that do not stand not for their knowledge and expertise. That sometimes folks come in and they, they don't really have a silk purse yet, and it's the folks who give them code guidance, it's the folks who help them think through, who answer questions, who help them figure it out so that that building gets built. And I say to them, we're gonna build on our competence because that's not something that folks know. Because really, when people think about our department, I said it before, they think about a permit here or an inspection there. And they don't think about the full depth and range of what happens in that department. So integrity, responsive, and competence, those three things are required for the public's trust but also efficiency. The mayor has been very clear on this. Bureaucracy cannot be an excuse. And I talked about some of the ways we were being inefficient prior, and we will continue to look for ways to be more efficient in this department. We have to make sure that our staff also have, have, our staff have the tools to be successful, 
and we'll talk about that a little bit. So I'll give you a bigger picture about what this $7.1 billion looks like. So after years of remaining flat, Chicago's ec economy is moving in the right direction. More construction activity has taken place, and I gave you those three metrics, but now I'm going to give you the whole big picture of what that looks like. So for my department, we have four department offices. A lot of folks don't know that. City Hall, we have a racing office where 80% of the workforce works. All of my inspectors come out of that office. We also have two neighborhood permitting centers. We're homeowners who don't understand. The first time I went up to the Department of Buildings, I walked in, and it's if you've been there ninth, uh, on the ninth floor, it's all these counters and lots of people. And if you are not a professional, you're not an expediter, an architect, or an engineer who's been there 100 times, you actually don't know where to go because there are no offices. There's no where to really settle yourself. And that's disconcerting. So think about, I think about, I always think about the homeowner who's coming in for the first time who doesn't know their way around it. So those neighborhood permitting centers are out in the community and they serve those folks who come in with plans for what they want to do. New grand order, they want to do a room addition. New kitchen, new bathroom, growing their family. And sometimes it's on the back of a napkin, sometimes it's on an envelope, and sometimes it's on grid paper. And our architects sit down with them in those permitting centers and they service them. And we weren't doing a great job at it when I came back in. And quite frankly, they were like no man's land. Nobody had visited them, and the folks were kind of out there all by themselves. We tethered them back to our central office because they were absolutely a part of our team. And I put additional resources there, so now we have two architects there to help folks through so that folks do not have to get there at 5 a.m. in the morning to stand in line to wait for the office to open up at 8.30 so that everybody who comes to be seen that day is seen that day and that they are assisted. So that's the four offices, 285 employees, 17 plan review examiners. I talked about that a little bit. Those plan review examiners, they saw last year 263,000 plans, 185 inspectors. And we can argue all day about whether or not that's, that, that's the right number for my department, but I will argue with you that each one of them is committed and should be committed to doing the best that they can with the current resources that we have right now. Last year, total 44,129 building permits, and that was nearly 1,800 new buildings that popped up on the city's landscape throughout the city. Our department average, you know, we're not a revenue generating department. We are clear about our public safety responsibilities, but we earn a little money along the way, about a million dollars a week. You know, it's nice to earn a little money along the way. 258,000 inspections last year, and that was in response. We responded to 52,000 citizen calls. That's calls to 311 for all sorts of things, whether we're having problems with landlords, whether there are neighbor disputes. Some of y'all might be, you know, with your neighbor and like you don't like them. Call the Department of Buildings. Whether that was vacant and abandoned buildings, all of those things. So 52,000 calls for service, and that resulted in 110,000, over 110,000 building code violations issued. And then there were the stop work orders. So let me just say, I know there are a number of developers in the room, and I appreciate you as a partner. We all have rules to follow. I'm trying not to look at any one person, because they're going to be all going to she was looking at me. <laughs> we all have rules to follow. I'm a, I'm a, I didn't say this. I'm a, right, I'm a cop, right? For 10 years, I'm a Chicago Police Department. So I had trained. I was 22 years old when I became a cop. I was there for 10 years. So my training is in law enforcement. So by background, I am a cop, which means I know enforcement. <laughs> I had a general contractor that had to bring him in because we had some problems. And if any of you have seen a stop work order, it's a big orange. Anybody here? Not, not yours, but maybe you've just seen them on. A friend of yours may have gotten one. Big orange sticker. We stick it right up on the front of the bill. So I, say, I said to the GC, you know what this is? He said, yeah. I said, let me tell you something. You're going to see a lot more of these if what happens today happens again. And you might say to me, well, Commissioner Davis, you can't be everywhere in the city. And I will say to you, I can be everywhere you are. <laughs> so we're going to hold our accountability and we're going to make sure that our partners are also equally accountable. And then on trade licensing, the way I think about this, we license the trade. And, and, and so I go back to the, you know, the professionals, the, the folks with the billion dollars, they can hire the right people. They can hire the people to get the job done for them. But I also go back to our neighborhoods and when somebody's trying to remodel a kitchen and they, somebody comes and says they're licensed and bonded and insured, we're standing there to make sure that they are. Because they're, what's the recourse if they muck up their house and, and, and take their money? So that's why the trade licensing, that's the way I think about it, and that's why it's equally important. So let me tell you about some of the stuff. So I became commissioner. I took a holistic view of the department. Like, what is really going on here? And, the, and you know, the thing I heard a lot is 
oh, this department's had so many commissioners, and I understand y'all haven't had a building commissioner here since Rich Rodriguez, so I appreciate you having me here today. But you have to look at really what's going on. So whether it's the inspections, whether it's permitting, the inefficiency, some of the stuff that I talked about, our accountability. For one example, I had 3,000 projects that were clogging up our e-plans. So these aren't 3,000 projects from you know, when the economy took a downturn. These are 3,000 projects since the department introduced e-plan, which is an online plan review um, um, permitting process or review process. 3,000, just sitting there. Nobody's touching them, architects, expediters, nobody's looking at them. Everybody says they want a permit. They want it today. Everybody, I want my permit, I want it today. But why are these 3,000 permits sitting here with no activity for at least 120 days, six months, a year? So I sent everybody a letter and said, listen, these are coming out of my system. It makes us inefficient. It slows down the process for everybody else. So while you're waiting for us to review, we have all these other things that we're also looking at. It took them out of the system. The accountability has to go both ways. Enhancing customer service, so right now, We've done some things, but we're going through training right now. Every member, every member in my department is having customer service training. So for my city hall staff, we've already had two days. That's eight hours of training. For my inspection staff, thank you, Judge Ballard, for letting my inspectors have the day off yesterday so they could be with us for training. We had four hours of training yesterday with 200. Y'all want to be in the room? This is, this is a nightmare. This is nice compared to being in a room with 220 building inspectors. So we're going through customer service training so that we can be better. I mean, we've had some feedback from customers about positive things we've done, but there is room and opportunity for us to grow. And then a improved communication. And part of it is really talking to City Club. It's talking to you. It's going out and meeting with architects. It's talking to folks about what the department does. It's, it's meeting with the judges so they understand our processes. It really doesn't take two years to get a building permit out of this department. Right now, if you come in today and as long as you play ball both ways, you're responsive, you're going to walk out of that permit. You're going to walk out with that permit in 60 days. And that's for mo And that's a significant improvement. It doesn't take two years. And that's part of being honest about what happens in this department. So when you have all this stuff kind of in the back of people's minds about what, it, what this department is and what it does, I'm here to tell you, this is who we are. This is what we do. And so part of that communication strategy is going out. And one of the other things that Mimi, can you go to the next? So this, I love this slide, and, and, and you know my boss, the mayor. I gave up swearing for Lent, so I'm going to try not to swear. <laughs> but I didn't, look, I didn't say anything. I just said, you know my boss, the mayor. So this, <laughs> this slide, the number one refrain was always like, oh my god, the department's so screwed up. Oh my god, I can't get a permit, so on and so forth, and so on and forth, so forth. So this, this is um, all the way on the far right. It's January 2012, and here is um, December 2014. So basically, the red line are the, it's how long it takes for the permits to be issued, and the blue line are the number of permits issued. You see something? The days to get the permit is going down, and the number of permits going up, and guess what? We didn't get a whole bunch of new staff. We did it with the staff that we have. We are delivering on the taxpayer. We're delivering on the mayor's promise to be more efficient with the resources that we currently have. And so technology has helped us significantly in that matter. So I'm going to fast forward because I think I'm. So I talked about customer service a little bit. I'm going to go forward to one of my favorite topics. Those were good feedback from customers. The next slide, there's some letters. Um, we get letters from, um, from folks. Some of you write letters about the good work that our, our folks do. I always write a letter back to you. I tell you who they are. So I don't want you to just say, well, I, think, I want to tell you who worked on your project so you know them by name. And so these were some of the projects where we received good letters. And I also give a letter to every employee who gets a letter in their file. It's the small things. It's the inches. We're going to win this by inches. It's the small things that make a difference. So one of the big initiatives in 2014, I walked in the door. I walked in the door. Thanks, Mike Merchant. I walked in the door being the commissioner in the seat when the rent came due on life safety ordinance. So this was a, yeah. This was <laughs> 12 years in the making, 10 years on the books, nine, 10 years you can debate about how long buildings had to be compliant, 732 buildings that were non-compliant and maybe in some instances non-responsive. So, I walked in all of these buildings and had to address them, and so I took this approach. I'm going to assume nobody knows anything about life safety, and we're going to reach out to the representatives of all these buildings to let them know of their obligations and to let them know, most importantly, I take, I take anybody take Bikram Yoga, where they repeat the mantra over and over and over? This deadline is not moving. This deadline is not moving. This deadline is not moving. 
And I was very crystal clear about that. And I said, so in the meantime, what do you need from my department to get this done? So I removed every barrier in our department. We had rallied the resources to have all the inspectors that we needed to do the inspections. Our code review team um, had weekly meetings so that folks had code clarification questions. If we needed to review um, reports and those types of things, we got that done as well. So we made sure that we were living up to our obligation. And then I called them in, one at a time, 10 at a time, went out to visit some, went out to the wards, met with the aldermen and, and their constituents and talked about the status of the building, building by building. In my office, in my conference room, over 429 buildings came in and sat in that room to discuss that 732, 429 buildings came in. What do you need? And we had those conversations. So that when December, 31st, 2014 rolled around, nobody should have been surprised because I was clear that every non-compliant building, every non-compliant building was going to court. And so I know that we're putting a lot on, on, on housing court, but it's a responsibility and obligation that we have to hold folks responsible for life safety because there are people who live in those buildings who don't even know about the requirements and that they are not um, being made safe. So actually today, um, after the 55 buildings that we took to court for not having a report um, that they should have had in 2006, today the first six buildings are in court today um, for life safety. And so I think that was the question actually that Dr. Green, somebody wrote down for Dr. Green. So that's how life safety is, is going. So a couple of other things. So I have another ordinance that's been 12 years on the books, cranes. So Chicago really um, has a great, you see them too, you can see the cranes on the tower, the mayor really, li now, I, now I'm, he talks about cranes so much and my, uh, what did my uh, friend, what if Penny Brown said something about crane being the national bird of something, or I don't know, she said something. But um, we permit all the crane towers and derricks that go up in the city of Chicago. So currently there are 15 crane towers in the air, one currently being assembled and four additional are under um, in the permitting process. And those are the big towers that, go, that are going up. And this is a point where my, my father died in 1983, and my father was a crane operator. And so look at me today, and I wish I could talk to him about this particular issue. But this was an ordinance that was passed some time ago, and so we're actually um, increasing the rigor and the requirements by which crane operators um, can and actually um, perform the work in those um, pieces of equipment. Another thing in 2014 were roof tanks. Actually, somebody here just had a conversation with me. Judge Ballard came out to the scene of a roof tank collapse. Um, to do an emergency order. And these are century old pieces of infrastructure that have been sitting on buildings mostly not even paid attention to. Some people think they're pretty, some people don't, but most of them have long lost their functioning and their usefulness. And so by ordinance, we worked on the ordinance um, because it takes a lot. Um, as, as the judge can attest to, on that scene, you have police and fire and OEMC staff and streets and sanitation and Department of Transportation and Water Management. You have all these four Department of Buildings tied down for days. It took one of the, 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 the last um, ones, it took two days for us to actually get that thing stabilized and so that we could make sure that the people who were um, in uh, proximity were safe. And so now there are new requirements to make sure that those are safe. In 2014, we increased the rigor around our um, some life safety as it relates to smoke detectors and um, carbon monoxide detectors made post-compliance no longer a defense. They have to be there. It's prima facie. It's, our inspectors are going in. I talked about those over 200,000 inspections. My inspectors are out there every day documenting the, the, what's the conditions in these buildings, and we are building upon. So that ordinance and also our problem landlord list, that's building upon the good work that those inspectors are already doing every day. And then the sprinkler ordinance, which I'm happy to say isn't our, isn't, isn't Department of Buildings to take over the finish line. It actually belongs to the fire department. But based on what I've learned from life safety, I'm actually helping out uh, Deputy Commissioner Ridge Ford, who's the um, responsible for uh, Fire Prevention Bureau, and giving him some tips and clues about some things he might want to do right now while there are still two years left in that requirement. And so I, 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 I told you a lot because I want you to understand. And then moving forward into the future, there are things I'm excited to do and to work on. I've talked to Brenda, this is a topic that really gets me excited, and it's predictive analytics for the buildings department. And folks don't think about that. So sure, we use it in police to try to identify hot spots and where things are likely to happen. But every day in the city of Chicago, we have buildings that deteriorate, that no longer become useful in communities. But folks are seen. Every one of us is a sensor. So for example, a little old lady lives in a house. 
not a shoe, a little lady lives in a house. And every day, she gets meals delivered by the city's Department of Aging, Meals on Wheels, every day, every day, every day. And then one day, she's not there. So maybe something happened to her. And then that house, and then what? The house is vacant. And then the house is vacant for such a long time that somebody comes and vandalizes it. And they take the things out. And then perhaps someone sets a fire to it. And perhaps squatters move in. Think about this. So there are things that we can learn and know about what happens to houses to, to, to understand which things are likely to fail, which things are likely. So I'm excited about moving forward on that in the future in 20, or 2015 and beyond. Additional technologies that we're implementing in the department. Giving my inspectors the tools that they need. Right now they use a tough book, a big old clunky, um, which was fine because we used those in the police department. They were mounted in our cars. We didn't have to carry them with us up a ladder to actually do an inspection. So we're working on new tablets and technology to streamline that. I actually, so everybody laughs at me because I was like, why can't we just get Google classes and, you know, like hands-free and I don't know. So Howard, maybe I could talk to you about that. I don't know. So um, and thinking about other ways that we can integrate technology to make it better and more efficient. Working on our permitting times, working on our inspection times, working on our responsiveness. So this is the Department of Buildings. We are the Department of Buildings. And I'm really, really, really excited that the mayor asked me to lead the charge. I'm really excited with the team that I have in place. And I'm excited to work with all of the partners in the room here to continue this good work and to share in this accountability and this relationship. And I'm excited that City Club invited me here to speak today. So thank you all so very much. Sorry. All right. Just because I spent four years at the police academy, except when I was there, it was at 720 West O'Brien. How many remember that address? Nobody. Nobody. <laughs> they loved the police so much in that day, that was the ninth public school ever erected in the city of Chicago. Okay, enough, enough about me. Tom Leah from the, of course, we all know this, but I'll just read this, the N-I-F-S-A-B. Um, what is, oh, you answered it. But I you answered could, that. Yeah, what is the process on the uh, LSEs? She answered that. Do we have any more questions? Yeah, here's one. Well, where's our people? Where's our people? We have people. Come on, you gotta, you gotta get in the game. You guys invite me here, I have to go pull my own questions too. I know, what can you yeah. say, yeah. <laughs> it happens to everybody. Okay, uh, Chris Anderson, Realtors. Is that your name? Okay. What equity do landlords, oh, okay. Playing hardball, huh? here we go. What equity do landlords have if the land if the if what's the, if the ban if the ban land if a, if a if a bad landlord why don't you read this it's obviously a real estate question equity what equity do bit landlords have with the problem land we don't say bad landlords with the problem landlords list equity recourse all right, oh, sure. so recourse. So um, if you are listed on the problem landlord list, so essentially, let me tell you how you got on that list in the first place, and I'll tell you how you can get off the list. Because compliance is how you come off, and it's easy. And we don't even, there aren't any fines attached with that. The way you get on the list is that you have, my inspectors, those 250,000 inspections that we go out, 52,000 311 calls, my inspectors have gone out and written you up for violations, for building code violations. And in the process, in a 24-month period, you have had two or more findings of liable, which is the equivalent of guilty, and administrative hearings. So we inspect it, there were conditions, you were found liable for those conditions at least twice in that time period. That's how you get on the list essentially, and you have to have in that list of violations some of the more serious, and I could, you know, you guys just ate so I won't go into them, but the serious violations that really impact, no seriously, that impact the quality of life for the people who are living in those buildings. So once you're on it, the way to get off is compliance, and the way you do compliance is you fix it, you call me up, we'll come out and inspect for $250, and you get to come off the list. That's the only fee that's associated with that ordinance. But there's a lot of power in that because then you can't get other things. You can't get licensing, you can't get a contract with procurement, you can't get some other stuff. So, because we've already tried, we've written you up, we've sent you letters, we've taken your administrative hearings, and we haven't gotten compliance, so we brought in some more tools so that we can get compliance. Have I ever been in a crane? So I came in, so I've been, listen, 
I was all set to go, and then it was a windy day. I'm looking forward to it. I'm not, I'm not afraid to go up in the crane. And when I, when I go up in the crane, I'll tell you how I want to go in a big one. So I will be doing that. Good answer. We have any more questions out there? Well, half the people work for you. The other half <laughs> want to get a break on their building. Uh, Graham, I don't think there are going to be many more questions. Yeah. We have one in the back. We'll just yell it out. You, you can tell them 90 days, that's fine. <laughs> I'm gonna tell you what happens, I mean, so, seriously. 60 days is, is dependent upon the architect or expediter doing their part and for us to do our part. And I could break, the reason why I love, I, lo I shouldn't, you know, the, the, where's our vendor, he's here. I shouldn't talk about it so great, but I love ePlan because the accountabilities are clear. It tells you and me every time the project's touched, what date and for how long. So all of this, your people have had my job for so and so, I can go into the computer and say, here, let me send you a report of what that looks like. And so provided that expediters or architects are actually getting back to us with the comments, because I just sent out a letter to about 98 projects saying, hey, your zoning is approved, you have all of, you, you're ready to go, we're waiting on you, and it's been more than 20 days, it's been 60 days or whatever it is. I had three people tell me, oh, we don't even want the project anymore. Well, you could have called and told me that. Our folks, this is what I'm saying, this is why the inefficiency, so we all have to work together. So if you want to say 90 days, that's great. 60 days is you and me working together, we get that permit out the door. And actually, we can do better than that. That's the average, so that's some big things as well as some small things. Okay, we have two questions. And uh, Al, is that Debonet? Oh, it's Debonet, great. Debonet, X in the U. Okay, Pullman Park National Park building. Building land bank oversight by your department, what resources for homeowners or developers? So that's not really my department. We don't, we're not the land bank. Um, and so resources for us, for me, we work with the Department of Planning and Development very, very closely. So any resources that we have, whether it's homeowners assistance for window replacement, some green roof and some or roofs and some other things, um, stairs and porches. But for the the big project, and I'm glad because I'm a South Side, I'm glad that it's happening. It's not really. That's more of DPD Planning and Development, which is Commissioner Andy Mooney, and our department works in the support role. Okay. Last question. And by the way, any of you want to have this uh, summarized? Uh, our speaker will be happy to provide you with a two-firm report. Oh, they don't know what that means. Someone, someone does. He does. Yeah. All right. Dory McWhorter. Where are you, Dory? Right there. YWCA Metropolitan Chicago. Remember the city club? I'll read it anyways, but <laughs> sign up. Uh, okay, I, that's one. She will be. Thank you, Dory. What role does the DOB play in planning for the city's economic growth and development? That's a great, it's a great question. I mean, so, Dory, you know that for uh, most of what we do is about enforcing the Chicago Building Code. So it's making new buildings that go up compliant and safe, um, making sure that current buildings are being operated in a safe and efficient manner. But part of also what we do is, because I mean, there are a number of, when buildings fall into disrepair, or they're abandoned or vacant, they fall to us to kind of take care of them. We're either working with court to actually clear those buildings, to get orders to demolish those buildings to make way for new projects that, that come up, or in, in many instances, we're working with organizations who want to come in and take over those buildings as the vacant buildings that are salvageable to take over those buildings as receivers. And so in that regard, and that's um, and many, I mean, you know, there are thousands of those across the city of Chicago. And so those are opportunities for folks to really um, take an interest and to participate in that way. How about a big round of applause for our speaker, Harding? Yeah.